Financial Phil, Phil McCoy, joins us via telephone. Philip, good morning to you. Good morning, guys. How are you all? What happened to 1619 and 1916, <laughs> Phil? Well, I changed the score, and I think that could have been a problem. I changed it to 21 to 17. It's Phil's fault. Now, if it. you were just going by the total points, I was close. That's Boy, true. That was, 37. That was a bad performance. That was a bad, bad performance. I'm, I'm a hopeful that next week we can uh, get some of that. It'll take a while to get that bad taste. Out of out of the mouths of Stiller fans, but the, uh, that was a bad Oof. performance, especially after all the expectations. I guess it goes to show don't put too much faith in what happens into the preseason, huh? Ooh, that was uh, that looked like a team that had practiced for its first time the day before, as opposed to a team that had uh, been in practice for a month and a half. That was just ugly. San Francisco's pretty good football team, but yeah, I don't care how yeah. good the opponent is. If well, you hope to be a contender, no, exactly. you got to play better than that. They're playing on a different level. Uh, San Francisco was playing chess, and and Pittsburgh was playing checkers, or maybe something of those sorts. It was a different different ball game. I think we, we were the we, on that field. we were the intern to the guy that was playing checkers. I think maybe he's, maybe he's, he's, he's gopher. Uh, Phil, let's talk markets. Uh, we have abbreviated let's time go. with you because we have uh, a report from Morocco literally coming in uh, in about uh, six seven minutes. Uh, what are we waiting to see to move the markets this week, Philip? Uh, this week, the biggest thing, of course, is going to be that CPI report that I think that comes out on Wednesday. And how, what, what is it, the proof in the pudding? How does it show up in comparison to what expectations are? And a lot of people are going to point to uh, increased energy prices, gas prices of late. But, you know, in, in this circumstance, there's a core CPI number and then there's an overall CPI number. And I think it's important to note that that core CPI number, which strips out the price of food and gas because of its volatility, is probably the most important number for this reading. So when you look at those two, the expectations are that the core number will be reduced from last month, but the overall number will be increased from last month. Now, the it's always this big debate because the Federal Reserve, they, they constantly say that the PCE is their preferred measure, and it, and it is. But leading up to the PCE, you get all these other measures that basically tells you what that personal consumption expenditure is going to be. But this week, all eyes should be on the uh, CPI report that comes out Wednesday morning. That should lead direct and tell us which way we're going and maybe get some of that bad taste from the markets out so far in September, and it was a bad august too although we we saved some of it but so far in september it's also been pretty poor phil the labor market's certainly been robust uh how's that playing into the market and how we're how the market's doing that's a wonderful question and it's, it's kind of it's changed back to good news is bad news sort of thing so right now you know throughout the summer the labor market had weakened a little bit but not enough to make us think that we're going into a recession but of late august september it has improved and better than what was expected and that is some of the narrative behind why our markets have fallen so good labor market that's an inflationary pressure we've seen very little weakness in it and we know that that supports consumer spending and we know consumer spending supports inflation so we have played that forward to say that hey the federal reserve is going to have to react more or at the very least it pushes out the idea that the Federal Reserve will cut rates in 2024, maybe early in 2025. So the the labor market has been, the robust labor market has been a, a, a headwind to the market. That sounds so weird and strange to say, but that is the environment we're back into. We lived that for 2022. Uh, in 2023, it had softened some, but not enough to uh, to lead us to recession talks. But now it's improving again, and that, that could be a catalyst that makes inflation continue to tick up or not meet those expectations, which, of course, would prompt the Federal Reserve into some sort of action or a, a longer time period before they begin to cut rates. So what you're saying is it is a phenomenally difficult balancing act. Uh, good news. Good news becomes bad news. Bad news can become good news. It's all you see it better in hindsight than you do in real time. Exactly, and it's like walking a tightrope. We want to see some 
um, weakness in the labor market, but not a bunch. And we certainly don't want uh, more jobs to to be taken up. So, and it, and, and again, I, I admit it sounds strange to say and counterintuitive of what we learn in school. But in this scenario, while we're battling inflation, a robust labor market uh, is an inflationary pressure, and it, it is a tightrope. We want to see some weakness, but not enough to make us start thinking recession. Are, is, are we getting to the point, Phil, that inflation is something we're going to have to live with as long as moderate inflation as opposed to severe inflation? I, I would, you know, and I thought so, and John Gilstrap kind of echoed what I had thought a, a few months ago where, this whole idea of the 2% target inflation, that maybe they would ease up on that and, and just accept the moderate 25 or even 3% inflation, say, hey, we've done enough, this is healthy, and let's move on. Heck, it wasn't long ago we were aiming, our target was 2.5%, but now it's 2 But at Jackson Hole, and that was part of the reason why we had a bad August, was Jerome Powell reiterated, we're aiming for 2%, and we are not coming off of that. So when he reiterated that, our markets took a tumble, and we had hoped, I had hoped anyway, that we say, you know what, 2.5% inflation, maybe close to 3 that's not too bad. And, and, and let's stop this kind of, as Rob would say, war on our markets by increasing you, rates. But he, but, <laughs> but he said, no, no, um, we're aiming for 2%, and we're going to get there no matter what. And that was one of the catalysts that made our August kind of, kind of nasty. I'm watching this UAW strike that's going to happen Friday. I don't see any way that this isn't going to happen on Friday because what the UAW is proposing is some uh, seismic changes in the way people work and how they get paid. One of their demands is a 32-hour work week with 40 hours of pay. And wow. uh, I, I don't see that as being sustainable. It reminds me of my uh, uh, younger days in the 70s and 80s when the Teamsters Union was uh, extracting major, um, uh, um, I'm trying to think of what, what the word is that I'm looking for here, from, uh, from the factories that they were uh, trying to, my father was a teamster working in a factory, of te teamsters were mostly truckers, but these steel workers and whatever, uh, they were all looking for major concessions from the corporations and got so many concessions that eventually these folks just shut the shop up and went and opened up uh, a factory somewhere else where the labor was cheaper. And I'm, I'm a little bit worried the UAW may be overplaying their hand with some of this stuff. Here, but. but isn't it just that, in large part, playing the hand? It becomes kind of a game, uh, like a game of checkers or a game of, uh, of poker, just seeing how far you can push an envelope, not expecting to get near what you're, you're asking for. Well, I agree with Bill, and it kind of reminds me of the uh, railroad uh, threats from uh, back last fall where the government actually got involved and they came up with a solution. <laughs> but, but right now, you know, it, with the labor strike, it puts in, boy, it, isn't it timely that while we're battling inflation and part of that inflation was the price of used cars because of the shortage of used cars, that now that the, the unions are, are, like Bill just said, playing a hand where the, it's an opportune time to take take hold of their full value. But it, it did remind me of, the railroad issues from last fall and and wondering if the government would get involved yet again to to come up with some resolution well i know when you negotiate you ask for the moon and hope you get something in between but having seen these strikes all throughout the 70s and 80s uh, this is starting to remind me of that and in that particular case People said at the same time, well, you always ask for this because we know the, the bosses are making way more money than they're admitting to. And eventually the bosses just shut the mills down and left. Exactly. Yeah. Right. So anyway, Phil, we're going to be uh, bolting in a minute here or so. Uh, anything else we're looking forward to this week? No, let's focus on that CPI, at least in the short term. And, and, and possibly so, what you had just brought up. After we absorb what comes out in that CPI number and react one way or not in, in the or the other, Maybe our focus will go to the uh, the auto unions, and and, we'll, and I'm sure that are, that are inside a lot of opinions, and maybe some anger because of the the issues that you had with new cars and used cars last year, and that inflationary pressure. It could be a headwind um, if, if there's not a resolution to that. All right, thanks, Phil. Have a great day, sir. You guys have a great week. Thank you so much. Good talking to you, Phil. Financial Phil.